Hey guys, it's Anissa. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about Ted Bundy. What's so different and what was so interesting to me about this case is that we're talking about a man who escaped prison two different times, someone who represented themselves in court or went to law school and was just really thought of as an ordinary man in the 70s. He just, he didn't fit the part. He didn't look like a serial killer. And that's why it was hard for so many people to believe that he was, he could have committed these types of crimes. I spent maybe six hours researching this case, so I wanted to get as much information for you guys as I could, but at the same time, I know I can't get everything in. That would be a very long video, so I'm gonna give you guys what I thought was important and interesting. If you guys have Netflix, I really rock recommend watching Extremely Wicked, Evil, and Vile. Hey. <coughs> <coughs> So I did want to add, with watching this movie, I don't really want you to compare it to this video because this movie is more based off of his girlfriend's point of view. So what I'm going to be talking about and what this movie you're going to be talking about, there's going to be some similarities, but a lot of this information that's in my video is not going to be talked about in the movie. That is the movie that I'm sure all of you guys have at least seen an ad for. It's where Zac Efron plays um, Ted Bundy, although I will say that one is a little bit more dramatized and there's even a YouTube video, I'll link it below, that points out just some of the misconceptions in that movie. And I would also really recommend listening to those tapes. They are long, but it's really interesting to hear <laughs> his logic and what he has to say. We're gonna hop in and we're gonna do this thing. So you might wanna grab a snacky snack because this is gonna be a long one. Ted Bundy he was born in Vermont in 1946 to a single mother. He grew up with his aunt and his grandmother, you know, outside family for most of his younger life. As a child, Ted seemed very normal until something very strange happened. One morning, his aunt woke up and she had all of these kitchen knives lined up in her bed facing her. And behind these kitchen knives, is Ted standing there and smiling. Weird, <laughs> not normal. As a kid, Ted was very lonely and a psychologist actually did analyze him when he was in prison. He believes that because Ted was so lonely, he would read lots of magazines about sex crimes, rape, how people got away with murder, deep dark stuff. At the age of 21, he attended the University of Washington and this is where he met his first girlfriend, Diane. She is the first trace of what started this killing rampage for Ted. He thought he was gonna marry Diane, he loved Diane, and they were very different in the way of Ted grew up more middle class and she was very, very rich. He was obsessed with her and she finally had enough and she broke up with him and he became very, very depressed and sad. It's funny because if you look at a picture of Diane, she is a spitting image of every single one of Ted Bundy's victims. He confessed to killing over 30 women. The number is thought to be much, much higher than that, more in the three digits. He graduates from the University of Washington and decides to enroll into law school. In January of 1974, when a young woman by the name of Karen Sparks, who lived just off of the campus of University of Washington, someone broke into her house and attempted to kill her. They sexually assaulted her and beat her almost to death, or what they thought was to death, with a metal weapon. I'm not sure if she's still alive to this day, but I know for the rest of her life that she was left with permanent disabilities. During law school, Ted was a volunteer at a sex crime hotline. He talked to many, 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 many young women who had been abused, raped, assaulted. He used this to find their weaknesses, how he could trap women easily, and how he could get away with it. There's two different theories about Ted Bundy and why he got away with what he did for so long. There's one that believes that he's actually was a very smart, intelligent man, and he used his intelligence to his advantage and would trick people and would lure women in, and this is why he got away with, he, with what he did for five or six years. There's another that he was just really, your average man wanted to fit in, and he used that fitting in part to get away with what he did. His IQ was average. In the spring of 1974, he decided to drop out of law school and got into the world of politics. And this is when women started to rapidly disappear. During the springtime, about six different women that they know of disappeared very, very close to each other. It was so difficult to solve these cases because with these abductions, no bodies were found. Some have obviously been found today, but some still have never been found. Along with the theory of him trying to figure out how to get away with murder by also being a regular man. People believe that he went 
to college and got his degree in psychology that way he could understand human behavior and how to weaken women how to use their weaknesses to his advantage to kill them and lure them in and sexually assault them and also how he got around the police for so long and then obviously going to law school that way he could learn the tactics that police use learned the lack of communication between police stations across state borders which he used very very much his advantage later on the first big break in the case was on july 14th of 1974 at lake shamamish it was a very nice day out there's about 40,000 people at this lake he approached two different women so the first one was janice ott he wore a cast the reason he wore the arm cast is is something psychologically when you see somebody who is at a disadvantage uh, physically or mentally you usually feel compassion for them and will help them even though you're humanly instinct and you know your parents always telling you stay away from strangers don't talk to strangers don't go anywhere alone with a stranger his charm he used all of that to his advantage and that's how he lured these two women in janice was seen walking away with him to the parking lot and was never seen again a couple hours later eyewitnesses saw him come back and came up to a woman named denise Lossland and used the same excuse and here ted made a very 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 big mistake he did not use a fake name to identify himself. He used his real name. Not only that did he use his real name, these eyewitnesses had three key things that they were able to give the police. His name, the type of car he drove, and a physical description of him. This was a huge lead. They had thousands and thousands and thousands of calls. They were able to narrow it down to about 100 suspects. There were two key calls that they got that just so happened to be about the exact same person. They tried not to focus just on one person. They got two different calls. One was from a professor of Ted's that said that he had a very strange and odd student in his class that always just gave him the creeps. The other was from Ted's girlfriend, Elizabeth, at the time. And she told the police that she thought that her Ted was the Ted that they were looking for. And for a long time, she was really in denial about it. It ate her alive. She just couldn't believe it because it's not the Ted that she knew and loved. In September of 1974, the police did find a few human rema remains, but they were able to identify them because they were so disturbed. It could have been from animals eating the remains or from Ted beating these women so brutally, decapitating them, biting them, bashing their bones. It was that bad that they couldn't even identify these women. He would choose his dumping sites weeks before he even knew what he was gonna do to women, who was gonna be his next victim. And not only that, he would take their clothes off of them and move them somewhere else 200, 300 miles away. He would torture and bite the corpses. He would go back to the crime scenes, that way he could sexually assault these women again and he would put makeup on them sometimes. Going back to a crime scene a couple weeks later is dangerous. Ted decides that he, for he forces himself to leave. He needs to go somewhere else. Another really big lead that they had came November 8th of 1974 when Ted was driving around in his car and saw a woman by the name of Carol Durant on the side of the street and he identified himself as a police officer. Carol thought it was a little weird that this police officer was driving this, you know, kind of old raggedy car and she just, she had a funny feeling about it, but she still decided to get in the car with him. He literally drives down the street and then attacks her and he attempts to handcuff her, but I can't remember what they, what, what I read, but he got one handcuff on successfully, but I think when he put the other one on, he attached it to like the same handcuff or something went wrong to where she could free herself. She rolled out of the car, ran down the street and saw this old couple and he chased her and she jumped in the car with the old couple and they took off and they took her to the police station. Ted's instincts are telling him he cannot go home without knowing that he has killed somebody. So he decides to drive around a little bit and goes to a school. He sees a young woman by the name of Debbie Kent, 17 years old, walk out of the school and he starts talking to her and she was never seen again. By June of 1975, 19 women are now missing across five different states. But the problem is they don't know about these other missing women that are happening in other states around them because they're not communicating, which makes it very hard to figure it out. On August 16th of 1975, a highway patrol officer pulled Ted over because he was not <laughs> A very good driver to be quite honest with you he did not stop at a stop sign and was kind of driving around very slowly in a neighborhood 
which is suspicious. When this police officer looked in the back seat, he found a ski mask, duct tape, ropes, just stuff that you would use to kill people. These police stations all figure out that these women look the exact same. They're all in their late teens, early 20s. They all have long, dark brown hair. They are all found naked. Their bodies have been mutilated. They've been, there's been signs of sexual assault, rape. And they're like, hmm, the same person is doing this. Ted was arrested, obviously, and it was really hard for his family and friends to believe this because he was just thought to be such a great guy by everybody who knew him. The only people who saw that bad side of him were his victims. But back in 1974, there was no DNA. There weren't surveillance cameras. There wasn't anything like that that we have today that's so helpful in helping us figure out cases like these. So all they could rely on was eyewitnesses. In February of 1976, they heavily, heavily relied on Carol Durant. He stood trial. He was found guilty and he was sentenced 15 years in prison. But think about it. This is a man who by this point is only going to, he's only going to prison for 15 years, but he's killed at least 20 women by now, but they, they, they don't know that. They don't have enough evidence. It took them another four months to pull a case together. Police departments from all these different states were pulling a case together to try to pin him down for a murder charge. One of his victims was a woman by the name of Karen Campbell. She was found dead outside a, a ski resort, and how they were able to kind of bring him to trial for this one was they found a gas receipt that they were able to track him back to, and they found hair that matched Karen's in his car. In January of 1977, he was transferred to an Aspen prison. This is where the tables really begin to turn. You'd think you have this man who is already sentenced to 15 years in prison for attempting to murder a woman. During his trials, he was able to help the attorneys. He was able to go to the library in the courthouse with no guard. He was able to go with no shackles, no chains, no nothing. Was able to study on his own. In June of 1977, in Colorado, during the court proceedings for the Karen Campbell case, he went to the library and the guard that was supposed to be watching him went out to smoke, which is not what you see in the uh, Zac Efron movie, but that's actually what really happened. The library in this courthouse was on the second floor and Ted decides that he is going to jump out of the window and he's going to escape. And he did. Bundy jumped out of this second story window at the front of the Pitkin County Courthouse this morning. He was scheduled for a court appearance and apparently had been locked into the law library by sheriff's deputies while attorneys were arguing a motion to strike the death penalty. Witnesses say he left in a hurry, however nobody saw him open the window and he escaped clean in an unknown direction. He didn't break anything but he injured his ankle and he, he still kept on going and he hiked all the way to the Aspen Mountains. He broke into a hunting cabin and stole a bunch of supplies like a gun, food, clothes, all that type of stuff and a couple days later was able to steal a car. This is where he got caught because the leg that he was driving with was the angle that he hurt. He's already not a good driver. He gets pulled over and he gets arrested. He was sent back to jail in Colorado to wait to stand trial for the Karen Campbell murder. The cell that they put him in had a light fixture that needed to be repaired but they concluded that nobody would be able to fit through it because it was so tiny. Well, over time, Ted started to look a lot skinnier and his cellmates, not his cellmates, but the people, his neighbors that were by him, told the guards that at night they heard him above, above their cells in the, in the ceiling and the guards did nothing. This was around the time of Christmas in 1978, so all of the staff, most of the staff was at home with their family celebrating the holidays, and Ted decides that he's gonna make a break for it. He crawls up in the light fixture, and somehow everything, you know, within any building, everything is connected, and he was able to crawl into an apartment of one of the police guards and puts on regular, normal clothes and escapes. This is not the first time he's escaped prison. This is the second time. This time, Ted decides he's not going to stay local. He travels 1,700 miles south to Tallahassee, Florida. I want you to put this in your mind. He's very well known in the West, but he's not, he's not well known down south or in any other part of America, really. So who's going to look for Ted Bundy in Florida? 
Nobody. On January 15th of 1978, he goes to the Florida State University campus. He goes to a sorority house by the name of Kai Omega. He went entered through an unlocked door at the house and went from room to room and brutally beat every single woman that he could find laying in a bed. Investigators said that they could tell in order of how he had beaten these women because the first one. We're gonna be on a, a slight commercial break and then I'll be right back, so enjoy. <laughs> No, they won't let me go, let it go! It's middle of the world, let me go, let me go! It's middle of the <laughs> Okay. Okay, we're back. It, it'd just be like that sometimes. Anyways, they could tell in order of women and how he got to them because the first one was just so brutally beaten, it was disgusting. And then it got a little bit less, a little bit less, and a little bit less. One of the girls was standing out in the hallway downstairs. They saw a man walking down the stairs with a log in his hand. And they obviously thought this was not normal. <laughs> and so she had, he just walked right through the front door. He left two of the girls dead and then two of them were unconscious. On the same campus, five blocks away from each other, he decides that his next victims are going to be in this house. So you know how sometimes houses are split in half? one person lives on the other side and then the other person lives on the other side but they have like the same it's not just one side of the house has a kitchen like both sides have, you know what i'm saying that's what it was on one half of this house uh, two girls lit two girls lived in it one was named nancy young and then the other one was named debbie i couldn't find her last name but i'll like put a picture of her in and then on the other half was a woman by the name of cheryl thomas that lived by herself on this night ted entered cheryl's half of the house and the walls that separated the two living spaces were very thin and nancy woke up and heard banging she was like debbie wake up wake up i think something's wrong with cheryl and she was like okay we'll just call her because cheryl and debbie had made a pact that no matter what they would always pick up the phone if they were home even if it was in the middle of the night and they were with a guy and just anything they would always pick up the phone just to make sure each other they, each other were okay nancy calls cheryl and she hears the hears the phone ringing but she also hears cheryl whimpering cheryl did not pick up the phone so nancy proceeded to call 911 the house is literally surrounded ted was gone but he had be in cheryl nearly to death but she survived not only is it so disgusting just of the act itself but he used the same log on all of his victims that night unfortunately four of the five women that were attacked that night died something i'm going to tell you now that is important later and is one of the reasons that ted was caught is one of the girls at the kai omega's house they found bite impressions. I think it was her leg that they found them on. Three weeks after his escape, he stole a van and decided that he was going to attack again. A little girl named Kim Leach was 12 years old. He killed her. It was outside of a school and she was never seen again. And what's so devastating about this one is that there was an eyewitness that watched it happen and he thought that Ted was just an angry parent that was grabbing his child. Ted was finally caught on February 15th of 1978. He was pulled over in, on the Alabama state line because he was not a very good driver. He ran from the officer and the officer finally tackled him. At first they gave the police a false name. He finally gave himself away and at this time, this name really, it wasn't notorious to people in Florida, Alabama. They were just like, oh, okay. They found out that he was on the FBI's top 10 wanted list. In the car, they found hairs that matched Kim Leach's. He was associated with 36 murders in four states at this time. One of the people that was questioning told him, they said, so you're associated with 36 different murders right now. Tell me, how, how does that make you feel? And Ted responded and he said something along the, along the lines of, well, when you find out who really committed these crimes, you're going to find out that the real number is in the three digits and they are across six different states. For the longest time, when he was being questioned, he always talked about himself in the third person, like would say he or the killer or anything like that. And then he finally couldn't finally admitted to it and start talking in first person. He was given a plea agreement of a minimum of 75 years up to life. And the day before his trial, he kind of got in a little bit of an argument, wasn't a little bit of an argument, he got in an argument, the plea deal was taken away from him and he had to stand on trial. During his trial, he wanted to participate, he wanted to be involved. So they allowed him to kind of represent himself. He was allowed to prepare for his case in his jail cell. I'm so out of breath, oh my God. <laughs> um, 
But this time they were making sure Bundy wasn't escaping. They lined his cell with steel. There was three different locks to his cell and not one person carried all three keys. Each three different people had a key each. During this time he actually sued the jail for inadequate conditions because he didn't have a light in his room so he kind of he had to hold his book out of the cell to be able to read and different stuff like that. He lost. <laughs> in June of 1979, he stands trial for the Chi Omega murders and for Cheryl Thomas's attempted murder and assault. And this was a big deal because this was really the first trial that was nationally televised in America. What also I found so weird was that Ted Bundy was able to cross-examine the witnesses, so he was able to question them, talk to them, which I think just makes it very unfair. He was able to question the people that he had either a tried to kill or watched him try to kill somebody or watched it happen. At this trial, the prosecutors had three different key pieces of evidence. The two of them were two eyewitnesses that saw Ted Bundy leave a a local campus bar the night of the Chi Omega and Cheryl Thomas attacks. And then the other were impressions of his teeth. One night, he was pulled out of his cell very late and the police officer was like, come on, I we need to go somewhere. So they take him, I'm not sure if they took him to a dentist or if they had a dentist come to the prison, but as soon as he saw the dentist, he he knew that they, they knew he had him. And so he was like, I want my attorney, like I, I want my lawyer, blah, blah, blah. And it's so funny because they actually had a warrant to search his mouth and get impressions for his mouth. So there was nothing that an attorney was gonna do for him. During this trial, the jury debated for about six hours, I believe. He made a statement, said that he did not, he was not seeking mercy for crimes that he did not do. And I'm not asking for mercy. For I find it somewhat absurd to ask for mercy for something I did not do. So I will be tortured for and will suffer for it and receive the pain for that act. But I will not share the burden for the guilt. And didn't really help him because he was sentenced to death. The jury, I think it was seven to five. At this point, he has a 15 year sentence. He has the death penalty. And then in January of 1980, he would get the death penalty again for the murder of Kim Leach. For the rest of his life, he served his time in Florida and he didn't admit to anything for the first three years. Like I said, he would kind of talk about it in third person. Then he eventually has started to talk about it. He thought that if he helped them figure out more of Find, gave them more information that he would just get the life life sentence instead of the death penalty. So he told the, the police how he killed these girls, where their bodies were. Some of them were still never found, but he gave them a lot of information. And he also admitted to beheading half a dozen of the 30 girls that were known. 7-16 on January 24th of 1989, Ted Bundy was put to death by the electric chair. It wasn't lethal injection, it was the electric chair. And there were a thousand people uh, waiting outside the jail for the announcement that he had died. His death was a celebration. People were so happy to see him dead because of how evil he was. And a lot of the people, some of the witnesses and victims that lived through his, the attempted murders of him said that they lived in fear until the day that he died. I know there's a lot that I didn't cover. If there's anything that I left out that you think is important, go ahead and leave it in the comments because I want to learn and I'm sure you sharing with everyone else will help us all learn a little bit more. Thank you guys for watching. I will see you guys on Saturday. Uh, so, bye.